How's everyone doing today? Doing great. Oh, great. All right. So let's start things off. Starters, I'd like to <coughs> give a special thanks to all my advisors, Mr. Steve McAlpin, who's here today, uh, Lisa Chella, who's a flutist and violinist at the uh, music department, uh, and Stanley McRae. Uh, the others I would also like to thank is Matthew Belzer. Uh, he's a head of uh, the jazz uh, group and a jazz band. So with that, we shall begin. A new world. To start things off, uh, how many of you actually have MP3 players, any sort of variants of said? All right, cool. Uh, how many of you have, you know, downloaded some songs in uh, certain ways without maybe, you know, <laughs> you won't put it on the record books. All right, yeah, yeah. What's yeah. the statute of limitations? <laughs> <laughs> Na I remember Napster. Yeah, you can, you can also plead the fifth, too. Yeah. Um, so, I began with uh, all, all this stuff as a jazz musician. I look at uh, how, how I can survive in this sort of a new atmosphere the music industry has been thrown into with all these new inventions and creations uh, by many people. It just seems that the world is moving at a much faster pace than the music industry has been trying to keep up with. They have done things like try to do things like in iTunes, and making you know little 99 cent songs, but why would I do a 99 cent song when I can get something for free? So that leads to my personal dilemma: How can I be a financially stable as a jazz musician in the digital age with all this stuff going on? So if I put a song up right now, who's to say that people won't just instantly find a you know free link and just download it for free or get it for free without me, you know, being able to sustain myself? And so uh, I move on with, uh, to met my methodologies immediately because from here it's, it's more of a business sort of approach where I think to myself, well, my, con my consumers want to get music. They want to get it now. They want to get it easily. They want to get it as cheap as possible. So I can either work against them or work with them. And I found that working with something is a lot easier than working against something. So what I did was I decided to compose a jazz song. It's called Sombre. Uh, I formed a band that's actually part of the class I'm taking called Small Bruce Jazz Band. We uh, debuted it on November, was it 14th, 16th? We played it on Flat Tuesdays. Uh, we will also be playing it again on December, uh, later this December. Uh, I recorded it. It took a long time to get that together because a lot of the bandmates were other college students, so they had, we had to balance that stuff out, so I, you know, I had to do some music management there and there. Then I copyrighted it, which is actually a lot simpler than it seems, which, because uh, when I asked uh, Matt, Matthew Belzer, he was just like, it's as simple as writing a little circle with a C inside and your name. <laughs> so I, I did that, but I also emailed it to myself. I also went to like an official website and actually got it all looking nice and pretty up there. Uh, I'll, I'll show that later. Uh, as for publishing, I put it on Facebook and I put it on YouTube uh, on different on like separate accounts from my like actual Facebook and YouTube to make it look more professional and have people have more access to me. I also put it on my other my like common YouTube and Facebook channel so the people that know me is like, hey, he does this on the side, you know. Get, just a little more personalization in that way. So also, when I was uh, writing my song, I, uh, well, and also during my research, I stumbled upon a guy called Mark Mulligan. He uh, did a, he did a little uh, presentation at MIDM, which is at 2011, which is uh, one of the largest uh, international music conventions in the world. Uh, it's, it's held in uh, Kenna, France. And so I try to incorporate a lot of his ideas to what I was doing, most specifically the social and participant aspects of his SPARK acronym there. So um, in terms of the social, I wanted my music to be accessible to as many people as I possibly could think of. I wanted it to be in formats that people are normally accustomed to, that people like. Uh, in fact, there's a funny story about that. Like as I was wrapping it up, I was, uh, my nephew was on the side watching TV and I was wrapping up all the CDs like, okay, good. I got all these CDs ready to give out to people who want to listen to it. 
He's like, and then he asked me, he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm just making CDs for my song so that, you know, people have access to it. I give it to them, it's a nice physical copy they can have and touch. And he's like, well, why don't you just put it on online or on Facebook or YouTube where people can just point and click and they got it right there whenever they want it. And I'm, like, and I sit, I'm sitting there looking at the CDs and I'm like, I completely forgot about that aspect. Just completely, like, it was ridiculous. Because I was so concerned about the business aspect, I forgot to incorporate the social aspect of it and the cultural aspect of it where my consumer base is a lot smarter than I give them credit for. They can easily just Google something up, they can go to a website, they can ask me, like, do you have like a website to go to where I can listen to all your stuff? It's so easy as a point and click away as opposed to me going there and giving them a physical copy of a CD. That's not to say that I wouldn't do a CD because there are certain people who like to just listen to certain things in that kind of format. And it's great for like something that uh, someone wants to listen to like in a business interview, I can give them a physical copy. So adhering to all sorts of uh, social and cultural uh, audiences is, is what I was aiming for when I uh, was looking at this. And that leads to this, my concept. So for the disciplines, I picked music, business management, law, and sociology. All of them are very fairly important, or actually very important. Uh, originally law was a secondary discipline, but it, it's, so, it's such a major part of why I'm doing this that I was just like, forget it, it's primary. So, um, yeah. For my bridging strategies, I, I have several. Uh, reasoning through analogies for music, uh, that, that is like the whole reason why I, I exist for me. Like I write songs, that is who I am, that is an extension of my expression and of my emotions. Sombre, I believe, demonstrates that to the fullest extent of my everyday life, where it starts off with a great, you know, mellow tone, and then it changes into like a melodic minor sort of thing, which sort of makes it sound a little dark a bit, which represents my, you know, my life. Like, it goes happily going. There's sometimes a little bit shaky and trouble, but then it returns to, like, the original tempo, and I'm going, I'm going good all the time again. Uh, I also uh, want to touch on uh, bridging the explanation action gap between sociology and law, uh, mostly because it is the, this balance between the two that is causing the biggest struggle between the music industry and its consumers about how much limitation you want to put on your consumer for them to have access to music. Number one, I think the consumer is always right. So I think the music industry should change their point of view as I have changed mine. And personally for me, I think having my music being accessible to everyone allows everyone you know, to know who I am. And if they know who I am, they'll be more than willing, eventually, hopefully, to buy something when I need to sell something. Because no one does business with no one they like. That is a fact. That is true. Right. So in conclusion, I've gained a much better understanding in the process of creating music for a global audience. Uh, a greater appreciation for artists and composers everywhere. Because I wrote one song in a semester when you know some people I know have written soundtracks in a semester. So I, I, I gained a greater appreciation for artists. Uh, I gained a better sense of, of how important it is to manage my time. Uh, this project in particular was very taxing on time, time-wise, because I had to balance it out with college, I had to balance it out with my uh, companion's time schedule, and, and even when start, certain things didn't work out, I had to plan ahead to make sure that we had enough time to you know, make up for that stuff. So I had actually, for recording, I had four weeks of recording, we only needed one day. And it just so happened we needed those four weeks because two out of those four weeks, the everyone couldn't make it because something came up. So that was a very important lesson for me that I learned. Um, in the future, uh, I plan on creating like a better schedule for whoever I work with or my other, my, my other bandmates. Also, would like get like more time available for recording and publishing. But yeah, that's my presentation. Yeah, Letty, um, mm -hmm. it, it strikes me in terms of 
uh, interdisciplinary or integrative strategies that can be helpful to you as a music entrepreneur. Um, I think you're also in a situation that's like uh, advancing by checks and balances. And mm -hmm. Shani used this technique too in terms of keeping different ways of knowing intellectually honest. And mm -hmm. here's the dilemma I see you in. And you, you talked about this a little bit. You want to be accessible to a global audience. So you want to put it out there, YouTube videos, and here's some free samples. And the internet, we're used to, as you, most people raise their hands. Yeah, we get free stuff on the internet. We love that about the internet. So you want to be accessible. Right? But that's checked by, you've got to make a living as a musician. Through your research, have you, do you have any kind of way of advancing past that desire to be accessible in a digital age and how to make money from your music that you've published in a digital age? Um, for what I've like, researched and done, actually, it, it seems like the first step is to get people to know you. You have to let people know you. If people don't know you, they're not going to know what you do or what you're about mm -hmm. and for jazz that's a that's especially true because jazz is more of a emotional sort of genre than other genres of music and as well as you know like I think again like you said advancing through checks and balances you have to balance it out it can't just be all money it can't just be all free mm -hmm. it has to be a there has to be a balance which is why I think the music industry is struggling because they're only thinking about their pockets right now so yes you just said how jazz is a more emotional style of music. In your research, did you find there be any differences between the genre of the music and their struggles with getting into this digital age? Yes, um, like certain cultures are more heavily affected by the digital age. Like pop music is was heavily affected by the digital age, but not so much as a jazz, like a jazz musician on the side. Like you don't see jazz clubs anymore. You hear about them, but a jazz club is usually like a mixture between like a rock band, they have like, the manager has like a rock band there, they have a jazz band there, they have, it's sort of like mixed together now as opposed to what it used to be. But, uh, you know, to answer your question, yeah, I mean, it, there, there has been certain differences between the genres, I believe. Uh, I think jazz, for me, was the biggest one that I got hit. Yes. So forgive me, I think I'm too busy writing to get this. Mm -hmm. But following up on what Stephen said, I mean, mm -hmm. you posed a very clear question, right? Mm -hmm. how, how can I be financially stable in the digital age? Mm -hmm. What I've heard so far is make people like me. And yes. we'll see if that works. Yeah, it's a, it's a test. No one has really, I mean, at this point, you got to try whatever you can do. And from my intro to entrepreneurship class, I learned very quickly that people, if people like you, they will have business with you. Uh, that is something I learned from there, and also when I went to uh, a, uh, they had a conference in downtown Baltimore that I went to, that our teacher invited us, where you could present yourself to CEOs, and they had like a meeting, it was really fancy, really upscale thing, and they were like, people were just very friendly, they, they, they really go out there to reach out to other people and make them like them, you know, in a subtle way, don't just be like, hey, like me, you know, you can't force people to like you. So you were saying earlier on, mm -hmm. this sort of the more passive version of that statement, they were, people won't do business with people they don't like. Yes. And I heard that loud and clear. Yes. But you actually need something more positive here, which is yeah. they do like me, they will do business with me. Yes. Okay. Okay. As someone who also polishes their own music, and um, I don't really have to, I don't really think much about the financial side of it, I just kind of give it out for mm -hmm. free. Um, and also to kind of illustrate how big of an issue this is for someone who would own a label, I can go online um, and download entire label packs of, say, Blue Note Records or other famous record labels. In one click, I can download 40 or 50 years worth of every single song they've ever produced. And so that's millions and millions and millions of dollars of production in what takes maybe a few hours to download. And so I guess my question to you is, how? what's the value proposition now in the digital age for someone willing to buy music like why should I if I can download something for free in the highest quality possible what I guess is kind of the new reason for me buying music I guess in the digital age all right hmm. well let me answer that question by asking you a question has there ever been anything that you have liked so much that you would be willing to pay for even though you know you could get it for free yeah totally all right do you know why um I guess I just would feel bad 
just taking it from a bookstore, or taking it from like a stealing a CD or a record from yeah, a record store. Yeah, we each have our own personal reasons for right. you know not doing it. So I mean, but there there is that certain something that's just like I am so willing to like give myself to this certain piece of music or this a certain media mm -hmm. that I'd be willing to pay for, it. and that's what I'm looking for right. when I whenever I do my music, that someone is just so inspired that they are willing to you know, be participant, spark, to be participant in my music. Uh, and the other thing that I actually did was, um, for all my songs, I also included, like, as funny as it sounds, I included a play along so that people could actually play and see along with what I wrote and how to make their music. Cause there isn't a single piece of music that wasn't inspired by some other piece. I mean, because when you think about it, it's like it all traces back down, just like an evolutionary chain. It all goes back down to a certain base, base form, and we're all branched out from that base form. Uh, Lodi, just to add to your uh, your bibliography here, yes, sir. Uh, I hope that's not the whole bibliography. No, but no, I have, no, no. There's, um, has anyone seen a TED Talk by the performer Amanda Palmer? It's called The Art of Asking, where she talks about the ethics of supporting artists. And she begins with an anecdote of, of uh, she's greeting her fans. She's very accessible digitally. Uh, she wants to know her fans. She, after a concert, a fan comes up to her and says, I burned a copy of your CD from a friend of mine. Here's $10. And she's reflecting on that experience saying, that fan, and this goes back to what you're saying, Laddie, about I need to know my fans. And they, you know, if they like who I am, they will support me. Same argument she's making in this TED Talk about because my fans know who I am, because I greet them, I build relationships with my fans, I can ask, or I don't even have to ask, they will support, they will pay for my music, for this music that cost me money to produce. So I think you're onto something with building relationships with your fan base. Yes. I'm also wondering if um, trying to fashion a sustainable business plan in life as a musician in this digital age where previously you would receive some percentage of purchases of things, mm -hmm. right? Um, if it doesn't push for more innovative and creative strategies around performance and direct um, direct participation with audience, with, with your audience, so that, you know, in, in moments like that, there mm -hmm. can be increased opportunities for them to support you, not just through the purchase of music. Mm -hmm. And how does that how does that factor in? Did it factor into your thinking? Um, to my thinking, it factored in heavily because the song that I wrote was also, it, was, it wasn't like, it started off as just being a lead off of an original song that I was listening to. I was like, wow, this is a really catchy tune. And I took certain elements from that and made it my own. And that's what I want other people to do when they listen to my music. They don't necessarily... Well, for this for this one in particular, they don't necessarily have to buy it. They just have to. I I wanted them, you know, to be more part of it, and you know, eventually build off something that they own, and it's their music now. So it it really is more about a participating sort of thing for this project in particular, and branching and them branching out from what I did. So that, that, that's the way I see it. Mm -hmm. Daddy, it, is the saxophone a visual aid or? It is, it, is a, it is a visual aid, and I can play something for you if there is extra time. I think that would be very appropriate, since there's nobody coming after you, I would love for you to serenade us to the Oh, <laughs> yeah. Wait, there's a question in the back, though, before oh, you... Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Oh, just... Okay. Did you find that a, mu a musician or artist's success had an impact both if you go willing to pay for the music, or if you go willing to pay? Because when it's someone off the pop charts, mm -hmm. I take that song by less than legal means. I feel okay because I think they're successful enough that it won't hurt them. Mm -hmm. But I follow plenty of artists on YouTube and I always pay for their stuff because I want to support them and keep them going. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Um, by, that is a good question. By their success. So, I guess I should only ask a question to you. Uh, did you feel that, did you feel more connected to the people, the pop stars or the people you listen to on YouTube? The YouTubers. Okay. And you, do you know why? Probably because they always have messages before and after. So like one's an acapella group and mm -hmm. they're pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. And so, then they, they have more contact towards you. You have yeah. to feel like a close relationship. So now you're more willing to pay for it. That's right.
Any more questions? All right, I guess I have to play now. <laughs> uh, let's see. I you know I have my song here somewhere. Can I use it for you to pull up my song? You can pull up your song, or you can play it live. you got a saxophone yeah, right yeah. there. I need a background. Let's play it. Thank <laughs> you. 